And Remy Link works with us at Cornell Cooperative Extension. She works with the Ag Economic Vitality Department, and she also does Maple Education and member of the Ag Team. And she also has helped with the Hosta Garden out front, getting that all in order. And she's been Hosta guarding for many years and her mother's a big Hosta grower down in Georgia, right? Yep. 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 And her and her husband own Lake Maple Farm. And we would like to welcome Remy. Well, hello everyone. Um, I will uh, going to talk about my favorite thing, um, hostas. That's probably my um, most favorite garden plant that um, that I have. I just want to let you know um, all of the pictures that you see here in my presentation are either from my garden or from my mother's. Garden. And um, I like to consider myself a hosta enthusiast. And um, I consider my mother a hosta nut. She gets a little crazy. She's very competitive. Um, and she um, actually competes usually at the Georgia Hosta Society um, quite a bit. <laughs> so um, with that being said, we'll kind of move along with this presentation. Um, I'm gonna run over just a few things for you, some key definitions, because um, I may mention a few uh, A crown should be pretty obvious. It's the base of the plant where the roots and the shoots join. Um, when we refer to the eye, that's that unfurled leaf that starts poking up out of the ground. Um, it's a dormant bud. Uh, when I talk about margins, I'm talking about the outer edge of a leaf. Um, as the example, the night before Christmas um, has a green margin. Um, that's how that you would say that. And pattern is leaf variegation. And um, the bottom photo is a uh, hosta called spilt milk. Um, that is kind of a connoisseur's hosta. It has a very irregular uh, leaf pattern, the leaf variegation, you can kind of see it looks like uh, it's a green leaf and it looks like somebody just threw milk on top of it and uh, it's kind of running down the leaf. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, you know, I would love to have done this presentation live. Uh, when I did it last year, um, I actually had, I had all the leaves and I could show you the actual leaf in person, um, but I, I hope this helps. <laughs> um, Petiole, when I talk about a petiole, that's the leaf stalk. And the, the photograph, that's the first blush. Um, you can see, um, can you see my cursor when I move my cursor around? Yes, okay. Th this is first blush and you can see it it's, has a red leaf stalk and the red actually is starting to up, extend up into the top of the leaf. Um, that's what a lot of the hybridizers are working on right now. They're, they're really trying to get this red out of the stalk and up into the leaf. Um, so a lot of the new, newer varieties are like that. This was one of my mother's blue ribbons that she uh, won at the show. That was, that's actually her first blush. Um, scapes are the flowers. Uh, why do I like hostas? Um, because they're really super easy to grow, um, aside from a, a few of the smaller, um, some of the mini hostas can be a little finicky, um, just because of their size, you have to kind of be a little careful with them, but in general, hostas are really easy to grow, they're easy to divide. Um, a lot of variety, uh, big leaves, little leaves, um, tall clumps, small clumps, um, you can have great big hosta gardens. Um, you can do hostas in pots on your porch, um, you know, in a, with smaller varieties. Um, you know, it's something for everyone. Um, if you have shade or sun, and when I say sun, it's sun tolerant. It doesn't mean to, some sun tolerant hostas, yes, you can put them out and they can have full sun all day, but they don't, they don't look their best. The, their leaves will get a little bleachy, especially when you get into July and August. Um, 
but there's a variety of locations you can put your hostas in. And there's also um, fun names. Um, my mother has a, a dirty garden um, and she has um, hosta called Hanky Panky and Gypsy Rose. And <laughs> so, and then she'll do, she has an ice cream garden um, that has all ice cream flavors. Um, so, you know, you can get kind of creative um, with the hostas. Um, requirements, like I said, um, Partial shade is the best, you know, in east or dappled sunlight that they do the best there. Water, uh, especially for the big hostas. The big hostas really like water, but that doesn't mean to drown them. They, they don't want to be living in a pond um, because you will rot them. Um, but the big hostas really do like water and to get that big leaf development, you really got to um, water the hosta. Um, but you can, um, like the example of the lemon lime on the slide, um, that's in a hanging basket. Um, you can oh, just about put hostas anywhere. Um, fertilization, fertilize um, after the leaves have unfurled. Um, you, you can fertilize. Um, you don't want to fertilize in the heat of the summer, July, August. Um, but just after the leaves have furl or unfurled, you can fertilize. Uh, you can plant them any time of year, but if you want to do the least amount of damage, um, spring is the best time. Um, you want to have, just like any other plant, you really want to have a nice uh, bed, and wider is always better with a hosta. Um, their, their roots go as deep as the, the height of the plant, but they'll go much wider. So if you can make a nice bed for them, uh, they'll be very happy. Um, you don't want to overwater them. You do want to set them um, firmly in the soil. Little hostas, be careful. You don't want to set them too firmly because you can suffocate the roots. Um, so if you've got mini hostas, uh, that's not something that you want to do. You want to kind of uh, be a little, a little more gentle with a mini hosta. And um, just like a lot of plants, uh, mulch around the plant. Keep the mulch off the eyes. Um, you know, it's just a form of rotten disease. Um, so, you know, let it have circulation there. Don't, don't over mulch your hostas. This was um, when we were working on, we did a little volunteer working on the hosta garden uh, in the spring. And um, if you do it when the eyes are just coming up uh, as in this stage, uh, you, you do very little damage to the shape of the plant. If you try to divide when the leaves are all unfurled and it's you know, mature, um, you're, you're doing it like in June, um, your plant will be mis misshapen. If you cut it in half, it's gonna look like a C shape. Um, but if you do it now early, um, it'll, you'll still get a nice rounded mounding hosta. So that's really the ideal time. Um, to maximize your size, um, planting in uh, groups, the same hosta in groups, then you can get a really big effect. The um, grouping on the right is Halcyon, a grouping of Halcyon, and that's um, actually over at um, the office uh, out in the hosta garden. The one on the left, um, this, is, this is one of, of my gardens. Um, you know, and, and, and it's nice to have a background. It's, you can use the colors as a, as a backdrop. Oh, juvenile and mature plants. Um, the two photographs, the one on the left is a juvenile guardian angel. And um, you can see the leaf is very pointy, um, doesn't really look very impressive. The one on the right is guardian angel and that's about seven or eight years old. Guardian angel is one of those hostas that takes a little longer to grow. So it's, it's a slow grower. Um, but you can see the difference in the size of the leaf. The juvenile plant does not look like the um, mature plant. Some hostas, um, there's not a difference between a juvenile and, and a mature state, but there are hostas that will have this um, difference. Garden composition. Um, I, I personally, myself, I like to have a plan. Um, my mom does the same thing too. We, 
you know, sketch out little drawings and we, we mark things. Um, you want to know what the habits are um, because hostas can be four inches tall or they can be 40 inches tall. And you really want to, when you look in this picture, um, if you can see my cursor where I'm circling, this is Liberty. Um, that is actually a giant hosta. It's going to have a five foot spread. So as you can see, I've given it plenty of room to, to grow. Um, one thing that I do, um, like I said, I, I try to do maps. This is helpful. Um, garden tags. I don't know. I, I haven't found a garden tag that over the years I don't um, lose the name or a squirrel or a chipmunk doesn't take the tag away and then I don't know what it is. But um, I, I kind of like this. I take a, a photograph of my gardens and I'll do this with my daylilies too. And, and I'll write the names on there so I know and I can reference what I have. I like to use a variety of companion plants to add some interest. Um, there's all different types of things. Um, and you're just gonna use the things that are appropriate to if it's more shade or partial shade. Um, a Stelby is great, uh, Solomon Seal. I don't have it on the list here. I also like using Speedwell. Um, that's a nice one. And the hardy geraniums, of course, are, are very nice to use um, with hostas. Any of the ferns, um, those are very nice companion plants. Um, miniature hostas are leaves under six square inches. And these are some of the examples of um, small hostas, twist a lime. Uh, that's at a mature step. Uh, the left slide is that's a, at a mature state. The blue mouse ears in the center, um, that's more of a juvenile. Uh, it can get a little bit bigger. The cherish on the right, that's actually a mature state. That's my one of my smallest leaves that I have. And I, I wish um, <laughs> I, I could actually show you the leaf and you can really see this, the scale of it. But if you look at this, the tag, these are very small tags. The, the leaf is it's barely an, an inch. It's like three quarters by three quarters. It's a really tiny one, but it's really cute. Um, small hostas will get a little bit bigger. They're six to 25 inch uh, square inches on the leaf. Um, it, it, we're not talking about the width and the height of the plant. We're actually just, just the leaf. That's how hostas are measured. Um, curly fries is, that's a fun hosta. Um, the bottom left slide, um, that has a nice, nice wavy lance leaf. Um, June is, that's a very solid hosta. Uh, if, if you have difficulty with plants, June is the hosta to go to. It's very hardy. You really can't do much uh, to, to hurt it <laughs> or put it in the wrong location. June actually is a, a funny one. If you put it in a sunnier location, uh, the leaves will be more chartreuse. If you put it in a shadier location, the leaves are more blue. Uh, medium hostas are 25 to 81 inches. Their leaves are a little bit better or bigger. Um, and these are just a few examples of um, the hostas. Wolverine, that's, that's actually one of the ones that's in my garden, uh, the center photograph. Um, and I brought uh, an example of that over to the garden at the office. So you can actually see Wolverine in the office. You can also see first frost is also at the office. I brought a piece of that one there. Large hostas, um, 81 to 144 square inches on the leaf. Um, you can see on the top uh, right, the yesterday's memory, that's one of the ones in my mother's garden. Um, and even her, her Christmas tree, the, the one below it, um, my Christmas tree, is big, but it, it's not as big as, her leaves are much larger than mine, and mine came from the same plant. Um, I think that's just a Georgia a thing. Sometimes hostas will act a little differently depending on what kind of location you're, you're in. Um, although hostas do like a colder climate, so our area is a better growing area for hostas. Um, the Abiqua Drinking Gourd, uh, the bottom left, 
that I also have a, a piece of that in um, the garden at the office. Um, so if you want to see the Abiku drinking gourd, um, giant hostas, leaf blades over 144, um, elegans, uh, that's a really nice hosta. Um, the Empress Wu, this is a new hosta oh, for me. I've had it for maybe four years. Um, that picture was just about a year or two old, um, but you can see my hand um, <laughs> on it. It's a huge leaf. And um, that hosta will actually get about five or six feet tall in the right conditions. Um, so, you know, you really need a lot of water, but it, it does take a little bit. Um, some common ones that you'll see, the Blue Angel, that's one that you see around in our area quite a bit, and um, even the Regal Splendor, I believe we have that also in the garden at work. Um, petioles, um, these are just a few examples of um, petioles, and like I was saying, red and purple, um, the Red October, we have an example um, at work. Uh, I, I brought a piece uh, in that garden. Um, but you can see the nice, uh, the underleaf is silver and the, the stem is that really nice purple. Um, the island breeze, that is actually an, an, one of the newer hostas. Um, and that's one of those ones where the hybridizers are, are trying to get that to come up into the, the leaf of the plant, the color. Sun tolerant. Um, this is a Good example. So this is Sage, which is a sun tolerant hosta. All three pictures are Sage. They're, they're not different, but they all look different. Um, the, the top uh, right is a juvenile. The bottom right is Sage in shade. And the left Sage is Sage in sun. And you can see just the color, and these were all taken, um, these two are at least taken at the same time. Um, and you can see how in sun it's very green and in the shade it, it's more blue. Uh, reverting. Um, sometimes hostas will, if you don't move them and you leave them where they are, especially the variegated ones, they may revert back to the original parent plant. And um, you can see these are a couple of examples um, that we have. Um, the one on the right is actually at, uh, an example at the office, and it's supposed to be a striptease hosta, um, but it's sporting to gold. There's some gold standard down here where the purple arrow is. Um, this is all one hosta, it's all one, one piece. Um, you can see the striptease in the back. And the Fortuny is, is really taking over, and that was the parent plant. Sporting is a little different than reverting. Sporting is like a whole new thing, um, where, where reverting is, it reverts back to a parent plant. Um, and you can see I'm starting these, both of these are, this is my, I, the one on the left is my first frost, and every year it looks, extraordinarily strange and I'm always pulling out these eyes um, out of there because I get these odd colorations on the leaf um, and I, I don't know why that does every single year it gives me a new something new so <laughs> and that just happens sometimes <laughs> um, diseases ha hostas really just have you know they have southern blight um, they, they do get heat stress sometimes, um, so like what I'm saying is, is watering. Occasionally, if it's really, really dry out, you may see them wilting down. Um, should water them. Virus X is one of those diseases that they really don't have an awful lot of information on. Um, it, it's... You want to, if you see any of this, um, it's like a cell collapse in the leaf. And if you see a hosta that just looks funny, it's, it's different from a leaf variegation. It's almost like you can kind of see, even in the, it looks like it's almost having stitching in the leaf and it's not supposed to have that. Um, you want to remove it. You want to just dig 
clean the whole thing out and remove it and then make sure you clean your tools because it will spread by tools um, just for, from you going back and forth. So um, dig it, remove it, put it in a garbage bag, put it in the dumpster if you see anything that looks like this. Voles, um, these are kind of, there's really only two enemies for hostas. Um, one is voles, one is deers. Um, voles are little mice and what they do is most of their activity is, is in the winter time um, where they really do their damage. So they're running around, they're looking for water and nutrients and they'll just attack, you know, daylily roots, hosta roots, you know, and all of a sudden everything looks great and fine. And, you know, come springtime, you look and, you know, you've got this big hole and that's because a vole just ate the whole thing. Um, you can use baskets to try to keep the voles out. I, um, my next slide I'll show you, um, I tried this last year. I had a little vole damage. I haven't, I don't usually have vole damage, but I did get, have a little vole damage. And, and I did try the castor oil with a gallon of water and the dish detergent. And I put that, I applied it in late fall, you know, after I raked all my leaves away. And um, I didn't have a vole problem. Um, so I, you know, it was my first year last year to use it. I'll probably use it again this fall just to make sure I don't have a problem. Um, but I was pretty happy with that. Uh, it, seemed, it seemed to work out pretty well. Deer. Um, and I don't know if anybody has, if you, if you have, <laughs> if you have daylilies or hostas and you have deer, you, you probably know and share all of the anxiety that I have. Um, you can use deer repellents. Um, I started with just the plain barbecue skewers. I would put them around in my hostas and um, they would be just underneath the leaves. So when the deer would come down to eat, um, they'd poke their nose. And that kept them at bay for a long time, um, very long time and not a lot of problem. Um, when that's didn't work. I tried things like the deer off. Um, Melorganite is also a nice thing. It's, it gives you a, a, a two bangs or, or you know, um, Melorganite is a fertilizer and it's also, um, it's made from the wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> um, so it gives off a human smell. Um, too, but it doesn't, when you smell it, the malorganite, you don't personally smell it, but the deers will smell it. Um, that can be kind of effective. And like I said, you're also fertilizing um, your hostas or your plants. Dogs are helpful um, because, you know, they'll smell the, the dogs. Um, you want to make the area un unattractive. You know, if you've got places, if you live on the edge of the woods and you've got brush, just like any other animal, you know, you want to get that stuff cleaned up. Um, and then you could also try f fencing. Um, so no one, this is what, this, I added these slides. I didn't have these last year when I gave this presentation, but no one likes to go out in the garden and see this. Um, this is one of my hostas. And when you start seeing the nibblings on the leaves, um, you know you're going to start having trouble. And um, this year, I have never had as much damage in my hosta garden. Um, it, this is by far, it tops everything. Um, because when you see something like this, um, this is not far away. And um, that's the same garden. The, uh, that's with the leaves and the after um, on the right hand side, you can see it's just basically stalks. You know, they just went in and uh, just stalks. I tried um, on the orange stakes, if you see on that right hand um, picture, that is, um, I have a little, just a little netting bag and um, put mothballs in there. That was also one of my um, repellents. And usually that would keep them at bay and I would just put them around the garden just to get that scent 
to, to ward them off. But um, no, as you can see, it did not work this year and I got devastated. And um, no area was safe at my house. So this is right next to my house and you would think why are deer like coming right up to the house, but they did. And um, why they didn't eat this June over here, the June hosta and they ate everything else, I, I don't know, but they left one and ate everything else. <laughs> um, so my last resort is fencing. Um, I've got this little four foot, uh, like a two by four pole um, fence and um, I fenced in my dinosaur. This was my really only big host. This had some damage, but this was my only area that uh, they didn't really devastate too badly. And I'm fencing it. Um, I can get away with a four foot fence because deer have a depth perception and that garden is long and skinny. Um, if I was trying to fence in my yard, you are gonna have to go with an eight foot fence um, to keep the deer out. They're not, a four foot fence is not gonna keep the deer out. If they can get a running start and, and, and hop over a fence, they'll do that. But if you have, um, if you're trying to protect something, and this is also handy with daylilies, um, cause that's another favorite thing for deer. Um, and the nice thing with the daylilies is you can take your fence down once they bloom. So if you're trying to protect daylilies, um, something like this would work. And if you can try to get them skinny, um, those areas. Couple of resources. Um, it's always nice to have a hosta encyclopedia. I have a, a couple of them. These, these are just some examples. Um, there's a ton of hosta books and they're always new ones because the hybridizers are always creating new hostas. Um, you can also get some information um, from the American Hosta Society. Uh, if you want, you can um, give us a call at the office if you've got any questions and we can try to help you out too. 